Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We will give everybody a second to get settled here, and then we will get started. Hello, everyone. We'll get started here momentarily. All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, if it's morning where you are. Welcome to the March 2024 PQA Quality Forum webinar. I'm Amanda Ryan, the Director of Education here at PQA, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our topic today is highlights from the newest PQA Social Determinants of Health Resource Guide. Before we get started, I would like to walk you through our usual housekeeping items here. First, please go ahead and submit your questions to us during the presentations today. As you think of them, if you want to just drop them in the Q&A feature that you see at the bottom of your screen, that will help us get those organized so that we can have a discussion with our speakers after their presentations. Also, the webinar recording and the slide deck will both be made available to PQA members within about a week following the webinar today. And you'll be able to find that on the member resources library section of the PQA website. And we will also post a recording of today's webinar on PQA's YouTube channel. And then finally, as you exit the webinar today, you will notice a survey that pops up. It takes about one minute to complete. We would very much appreciate your feedback on that survey. It does help to inform our future programming. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's speakers. First with us is Kyra Leonard, who is a PQA Executive Fellow. And then also with us is Faria Chowdhury, who is a Clinical Assistant Professor at the Purdue University College of Pharmacy. Thanks to both of you for being with us today. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Kyra. Thanks, Amanda, for your introduction. As mentioned, I am Kyra Leonard, one of the Executive Fellows at PQA. Since joining the PQA team last summer, I have had the honor of working extensively on the third edition of the SDOH Resource Guide. Like previous issues, our third edition documents innovative real-world SDOH services that are promising for improving the quality and safety of medication use. PQA is excited to continue our work disseminating information about innovative SDOH-related interventions by pharmacists through an array of services. Pharmacists continue to be uniquely positioned to connect with community members and learn about the true impact their social needs have on medication access. This unique resource serves as a, a centralized repository of examples of SDOH services that can be implemented in various settings in partnership with pharmacists, pharmacies, and others. Towards the end of the webinar, we will discuss specifics about how to access the guide on our website. I am proud to report that the third edition of the guide details 40 total initiatives. This is eight more than the previous edition and twice as many as our first edition. This year, we were also able to place special focus on initiatives that aim to provide food nutrition security while updating 10 entries from the previous edition. Our special focus on food nutrition security included eight new initiatives that aim to increase access to nutritious foods, other new features include themes of successful initiatives located at the beginning of the guide that summarizes five tactics employed by successful SDOH programs. Since PQA has been working in this space, these are a culmination of what we've seen over the three years in producing the guide. These themes are essential key takeaways from things that went well for organizations implementing these tactics. Our other presenter today, Faria Chaudhry, will be expounding on one of these themes, collaborative community partnerships, within her own initiatives when she presents here shortly. The last exciting new feature is the complete reorganization of the guide. So our entire publication has been restructured in order to group initiatives by setting uh, for easier reader navigation. All of the SDOH resource guide entries address multiple barriers to quality medication access. If you aren't already familiar with the guide, you'll quickly realize that most initiatives address multiple barriers similar to the ones faced by the patient populations that they serve. 
Because patient screening, referral, and intervention contribute to a more comprehensive approach to healthcare delivery, our goal at PQA was to feature programs and services that move beyond simply identifying SDOH factors. With that, this graph depicts the number of initiatives by type of service offered, including 24 different screenings, 20 referrals, and 33 interventions. Our initiatives usually offer more than one type of service, so that's why these values uh, in the categories add up to more than 40. If you recall from my previous slides, I mentioned the primary focus areas for the third edition of the guide. Similar to types of service, initiatives address multiple barriers, which is why these will add up to 40 as well. Most initiatives address cultural or literacy barriers, followed closely by transportation at 27 and screening for unmet needs at 24. I also want to call your attention to the 21 entries that address food security in this edition. This is an increase from the th only 13 initiatives that we had uh, for food security in last year's second edition. Decent, safe, and affordable housing had the lowest representation with 14 initiatives addressing this area. This chart shows us that most initiatives in the uh, SDOH resource guide took place in the community pharmacy setting, which makes sense because pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare professional in the country. Even accounting for rural areas, nearly 90% of people in the United States live within five miles of a pharmacy. Non-traditional healthcare in various sites came in next with eight and six initiatives respectively. These settings included telepharmacy interventions, barber shops, churches, in-home interventions, and outreach clinics across various sites. The proportion of initiatives serving patients at the national, regional, state, and local scale can be seen in this visual. Most initiatives at 18 focused on local efforts to impact SDOH barriers related to care. From these initiatives, it is important to note that local partnerships often led to efficient screening, referral, and intervention. Now moving on to some logistics. This is a screenshot of one of the initiatives that Purdue was involved in. As stated before, the third edition of the resource guide can be found on our website. There, you will find that each initiative features a few key components. On the top left side of the page, there is a label to indicate if an entry is new or updated. The organizations involved in the initiative are listed under the table, followed by keywords above a brief description and additional information that references some of the categories we previously discussed, such as the type of service, key takeaways, SDOH areas addressed, setting, scale, and target population. Intervention details and outcomes are also reported for each initiative. On the second page, some initiatives also include lessons learned since implementation. So if you're interested in an overview of characteristics about the initiatives featured, please feel free to browse our appendix uh, in the, at the end of the SDOH resource guide, as it includes categorizations of each initiative based on the areas identified on the screen. With that, I am excited to turn things over to Dr. Faria Chaudhry. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. So as mentioned, my name is Faria Chaudhry. I'm here representing the Center for Health Equity and Innovation, also known as Checky from Purdue University. It's always really exciting to share about initiatives that you're really passionate about. So today I'm really excited to have you all here. Um, so moving on, I thought it would be really interesting to share the journey of how we came up with the intervention, jo not just necessarily sharing the intervention we had, but how we developed it, because there's so many lessons that are learned along the way, and every organization and healthcare system is a little bit different, and those nuances make a big impact in the success of your intervention. So uh, we'll just get started along the journey. So at Checky, we're really focused on developing upstream solutions to the social drivers of health, um, so for this one in particular, we focused on food insecurity. And so when I say looking for 
innovative solutions, what are we doing more than just screening and referring patients? If we do realize that there's a gap, what are the interventions that we as pharmacists can start implementing to be able to impact these? So the first phase is obviously diving into food insecurity and understanding the different disparities within that. All obviously the social drivers of health, these are macro level factors that can either enhance or diminish your resources that can impact your health. And within that, you notice that there are disparities within that for food insecurity. So what we realized is there are a plethora of different resources that are available to impact this, but there are gaps in the care. So for instance, SNAP is available for patients. This is a great referral you can have for patients, but a lot of people don't meet the criteria to be able to get enrolled in it. And so tying that together, we realize that there is a big disparity in the types of people that are experiencing food insecurity. You'll notice from this graph here, we realize that a lot of minorities are experiencing these disparities the most. That really helped us define what our target population would be. So this information was used when we were defining the exact zip code that we wanted to target for this intervention specifically. The next thing is understanding the landscape, understanding the resources that are available because you don't want to reinvent invent the wheel. You wanna be able to develop something that is innovative and complements it. So some of the things that we found is there are obviously inequities. And when you're targeting this type of population, what you're gonna come across is that they have numerous barriers to be able to have this care. So some of those things that we started looking into is if there are resources that offer food sources, if they are, are they nutritious? Do people have access to them or do they have barriers such as transportation? Is it culturally appropriate for them? And then is that being complemented or supplemented by some kind of behavioral support so that these patients can have more longitudinal impact from these interventions? And then the last thing we obviously did was seeing, is there any evidence or support to be able to develop a model for being able to impact food insecurity? What we did realize is there is really rich conversation kind of coming around defining what food medicine is, but there isn't a lot of evidence to define a model that is replicable and scalable for other institutions and places to be able to use on their selected demographics. So that kind of set us up for being able to say, okay, we obviously have been able to define what food as medicine is, but can we create a model that other people can use that is scalable? And then the last thing was, uh, does food insecurity impact health? And obviously this is a very yes, screaming it from the top of your lungs. We realized that there are lots of socio-emotional, cognitive uh, motor functions that are impacted by it. And then the complexity of it is it just keeps stacking on top of each other. A lot of these patients that are under-resourced are already suffering from disparities, and this affects their mortality, especially in minorities. So this really helped us decide what we were going to be collecting data-wise for this service. And we decided that we were going to start collecting clinical outcomes because there is evidence that supports that if you do impact food insecurity, you do have impacts on it. So that was all of the background that helped us define what we're going to do, how we're going to do it to ensure that it's going to be successful. Now, um, the final thing is whose responsibility is it to close the gap in an equitable manner? Who has the resources to be able to do this? Is it one organization? And there are a great number of historical and contemporary injustices that these patients are facing. And so this really helped guide us to be able to partner with a lot of community partners to say, okay, this is not just one organization's job. This has to be something that different organizations can bring their strengths to come together and really synergize to be able to impact this in a meaningful manner and equitably. 
So moving on to the fun stuff, what is the intervention that we developed? So the first thing is, is we decided to partner with key community partners and stakeholders. As you'll see in my slide, I have a bunch of logos kind of nestled at the top and bottom. So obviously we represent Purdue University. And then we also partnered with American Heart Association. They really gave us a bridge to be able to access the community. And they have great resources that focuses on behavioral changes and counseling that we've really been using for the patients. The next one is Indiana Health University. This is obviously uh, where we get our referrals from and the patients, and it really helps us to be able to tie the healthcare portion with being able to impact food insecurity. The next one is Gleaners Food Bank. They provide us with the produce. And then the last one is Nourished Rx. Nourished Rx is a partner that creates pre-made tailored meals that are medically adequate for patients. And so you'll see in the next slide when I go more into depth on what the intervention is on how they were able to help us and support us. So we decided that we were going to create a model that partnered with all of these different organizations to create medically tailored meals that would be able to be given to patients. So this would be informed not only by healthcare providers that provide the referrals, we have dietitians, food banks, and the patients themselves, because one of the things that we really wanted to focus on being able to provide patients is to be able to personalize these. One of the things that we came across is sometimes when food is available to these people, it might not be according to their personal or cultural preferences. So we really wanted to be able to add that to patients um, for to pick from. The next part is that we wanted to complement these meals with counseling and health coaching. And this is offered through the entirety of the program so that we can really have longitudinal behavioral changes in patients. Instead of just providing an intervention, here are your meals, and then when it ends, they don't come out with more knowledge on it. We wanted to be able to provide them the food and then also get a lot of counseling on defining what are nutritious meals, how do they impact your health and your body, being able to support patients and to be able to cook them by themselves. So they're given lots of recipes and any kind of tools so they can do it for themselves. And then uh, the next one, which was integral in the success of this program is we did connect and hire a community health worker Community health workers are really our bridge to the community. This really offers us a flipped model because they have lived experience and they look like the communities that they're serving. This is really important in helping patients feel comfortable in the services that are being provided, especially since diet and food insecurity is something that is so personal to patients. We were very intentional in being able to pull in community health workers that could connect with these patients. And so the community health worker not only got patients enrolled in the program, but they also did a full on screening on other needs that these patients might have so that they can be successful in all other aspects. So whether these were other referrals to SNAP or WIC, or if they have any transportation issues to be able to get this food, they were available to be able to address those and kind of be like the helping hand throughout the process. And then with all of this, we wanted to have data that could really influence policy through an evidence-based approach. Uh, this is really neat over here. This is actually our food locker. So patients are able to put in their order online once a week, and they're able to put their preferences on the different meals and foods that they want. And they actually get a code that they're able to come to these lockers and put in by themselves and get those boxes out at their own convenience. This also really helps with protecting privacy for patients and really giving them the power and ownership of the meals that they have. Okay, so this is a little bit of a more in-depth overview of what the program looks like. This is just specifically one program. A lot of the programs that we do offer focus, they vary in time range. Some of them go for six months. This one in particular is for 14 weeks. 
So when the patients get enrolled, uh, what happens is the provider will screen them in the clinics with defined inclusion and exclusion criteria. If they do meet inclusion, then they are sent uh, from their appointment straight downstairs conveniently at the nutrition hub where the community health worker is waiting and they can help get them enrolled in this program teach them how to order their foods. And if they do have a barrier to not be able to have internet access, then the community health worker helps navigate that. And then um, they receive constantly throughout the entirety of the program, they get nutrition consults, they have check-ins, wellness resources, so that we are really complementing that food with other knowledge that can be integrated into their own lives. Um, so for the first two weeks for this in particular, they got nutritious meals that were already tailored and made to them. And like I mentioned before, these meals are informed not only by the providers that give the referrals, but also by the patient's own preferences. And throughout this process, they actually do get um, little surveys that ask them, did you finish the meals? What did you like? What didn't you like? So that we can keep pivoting to be able to customize it to patients. And then after that, they are switched over to groceries. And this is when they can go in. And after having that example of what these meals looks like, they can have their own boxes where they go in and order between produce, dairy, protein, the different kinds of foods that they want for that week in their boxes and then pick it up. And these boxes are intended to last for a week and not only for the patient, but also for their families as well, because we understand that if someone is experiencing food insecurity, most likely people in their family are as well. And we wanted to be able to provide that for them. Okay. And then on to preliminary outcomes. So this is some of the outcomes that we decided to uh, track in these patients. And so for this one, we have A1C and systolic blood pressure. Something I really wanted to draw your guys' attention to was that most of these are post-pilot. Obviously, if you're providing nutritious meals to patients while they're receiving meals, you're going to see a lot of these increase or um, get better, like their blood pressure and their A1C. But what happens after that intervention is pulled out? Because we really wanted to be intentional to make sure that these changes are longitudinal. So really, really exciting stuff. As you'll see, as time goes on, even when it's three months post or six to nine months, and even after that, we are still seeing an improvement in their A1C and their blood pressure. And this is really great news because this shows that the model that we're developing is being successful and having that complementary education on the side is helping patients integrate this in their lives in a better fashion. The next one, obviously for food insecurity, we want to be able to screen these patients to see if we're actually impacting nutrition and food insecurity. Like I mentioned before, uh, when patients get enrolled in this, the community health worker does a fabulous job screening for any other barriers that they have that we can help them if they are barring them from being able to reach their outcomes. And so these are just uh, some of the members and this is their intake. And by the end of the program, if they were still facing nutrition insecurity and at what level. And so you can see from the right side, obviously very exciting that it improved in every single category, whether they were not facing it or facing it at a low value or higher, which was obviously very important to us. And then um, going on to more outcomes, as pharmacists, we obviously think about medications when forming these. So this was no different for us. We wanted to know, obviously these patients, this is something that we are offering them in addition to their standardized clinical care that is being offered to them. And so when we were defining what that data looks like, we really wanted to be able to get detailed data that shows are those patients, their numbers and outcomes, are they improving because of the intervention that we're offering them? Or were they getting intensification on the medications they were on during that time? Why are we seeing the changes that we're seeing? So something that we did is that we did see if there were any changes in A1C with or without any major medication changes. 
So when I say what is a major medication change, we define this as any medication that could impact their A1C 1.5% or higher during the intervention time. And that would be a major medication change. So looking at these values, really exciting stuff, especially at the bottom. Um, you can see that patients, even without having any major medication changes, we were still seeing an improvement in A1C. And obviously there are lots of confounding factors that can go into this, but what we do have and some kind of data is that this might be an indication that this intervention that we're offering is really improving their outcomes, their clinical outcomes, and it is a meaningful intervention to be able to provide to patients in addition to standardized clinical care. And then obviously always comes down to the bottom line is, okay, we are improving their clinical outcomes, but what about the monetary benefits for these patients? So we did do and are still doing an ongoing cost effectiveness evaluation on these patients. So we measured this in um, the quality of life years added on for patients. So the monetary cost with this intervention per patient was about $1,279. And so when we did offer this intervention for them, each patient gained an expected 5.10 quality adjusted life years per patient, which is really exciting news. And when you translate that into a net uh, monetary benefit, this is well over $200,000 per patient. We are obviously, uh, these interventions are still ongoing and we have really exciting things coming down the pipeline, looking at readmission rates, especially for patients who have acute admissions and seeing what is a monetary benefit of being able to support them with quality food uh, interventions. Okay. And then obviously barriers that we came across because this is always really important when you're creating any kind of intervention. So the first one was being able to provide convenient services to patients who face numerous barriers. I did touch on this a little bit. Sometimes these things are not quite as easy to be able to figure out what these barriers were. Like one really interesting thing we found was that a lot of patients wanted utensils to be able to cook the food. So obviously that was something that we had to go back on and find donations or find a budget to be able to provide these for patients. So a lot of patients were preferring to have different kinds of spoons and cutting and silverware so that they could cook these nutritious foods. And then obviously, if they're having any kind of transportation problems, we wanted to be able to impact those so there were no barriers. The next one was enrollment parameters for patients. We always say that we lead with the service first. We want to be able to provide really meaningful interventions for these patients and the research comes second. But uh, I did mention that one of our main um, outcomes that we're trying to show is the model that is replicable. So we had to kind of stick to that to be able to show data to say, hey, this intervention is meaningful. And so having to make very strict parameters for patients that are enrolled during each phase was a little bit difficult. And that goes right into the next thing. Obviously, when um, different providers were hearing about this service, they wanted to get their patients enrolled or patients that did receive these services, they would kind of have word of mouth to tell their friends about this. And obviously, you know, someone else who's experiencing food insecurity, they also want to be able to access that food. And so it was way more difficult than we imagined to have to say no to these patients because we want to be able to show data that is adequate to show that this should be replicated. And in doing that, we have to be very strict in our parameters so that the research is sound. And so one of the things that we did end up doing was we did get donations for emergency food so that if patients did come to us, we would be able to give them at least something that we didn't have to turn them away um, empty handed. So uh, especially since these are very sensitive topics, there are lots of emotions that are involved with this kind of intervention. So you always have to be very sensitive and compassionate when dealing with any kind of these things. 
And then the last one was being able to connect the health system with community partners without putting patients' uh, PHI at risk. Uh, I think I mentioned this a little bit before that there's not a lot of evidence that shows how this model should be defined. So it really came down to defining, okay, what is research and what is a rendered service provider? And if they are a rendered service provider, what are the different things that they need from patients so they are able to be able to serve them properly? So for example, with Nourished Rx, when they're developing these medically tailored meals, it's obviously very important to know the types of chronic diseases that these patients have, the types of medications that they're on in case there's any uh, food and medication drug interaction. We want to be clear about that. And so that is obviously PHI. And so we worked a lot with the legal team to really define what this means and how we can use uh, different kinds of resources to get this information to the service providers without putting it at risk. And we're still learning, honestly, at this point, because this is something new. We're still defining what it means to impact when we say food is medicine. And then for future directions, obviously we're extremely excited for the work we've been doing with our preliminary outcomes. We're seeing really good outcomes. We're getting good feedback from the community. I think when you start any kind of intervention, one of the biggest things you absolutely need is buy-in from the community. And we have been really fortunate that we have been getting buy-in from the community. So for future directions, these are some of the target uh, clinics and target patient populations that we hope to grow to. Okay, thank you so much. I will pass it over to Amanda now for Q&A. All right, thank you so much, Faria. Thank you also to Kyra for sharing all this information with us today. A couple of takeaways I noticed from your information, Faria. Um, if our listeners would like to see a description of the intervention you just described, it is one of the 40 that is in the SDOH guide. I'm actually gonna go ahead and drop the link into chat now. Um, so that if you would like to access the guide, you can do that. Um, but the couple of things Faria mentioned that you can use, whether you're looking to address food and nutrition security or any other types of social need, is really thinking about incorporation of community health workers. We've seen lots of interventions around the country, including community health workers that are working directly in pharmacies to really address a lot of different types of social need. And then another thing that I picked up that she just shared with us that we continue to see over and over again is really needing to tailor a particular service and intervention to a community and to that particular patient population. So I'm glad that uh, Faria was able to share that with us today. And uh, at this point, we will transition now to our question and answer portion of the webinar. Um, I'd like to remind you all, if you do have a question, for our speakers today, please use the Q&A feature that you see at the bottom of your screen to send us those questions. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got a few that we can get started with. So Faria and Kyra, if you wouldn't mind uh, joining me here, we can get started. There's Faria and there's Kyra. Fantastic. Thank you uh, to both of you again for speaking to our audience today. Kyra, the first question we have here is for you. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned the five tactics that we have listed near the beginning of the SDOH guide that have been employed by the successful SDOH programs from really all around the country. So since that's part of this third edition and it's new to this edition, would you mind telling us a little bit more about those five tactics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for your question. So. Last year, when we were sort of incorporating member feedback and really finding out what the readers liked about the guide and what sort of um, suggestions suggestions for improvements they had, there was this need um, to sort of be able to quickly identify which initiatives could be replicable, depending on uh, the practice setting. Um, in addition to that, there also, Amanda, you kind of hinted at it, there was almost a vital need for community partnerships. Um, that was one of the tactics we identified. Um, another thing was training. 
Um, and I think this might come as a bit of a surprise for people because, um, you know, people think of pharmacists as uh, clinical professionals because we are, but um, there is a lot of cultural sensitivity training that a lot of pharmacists don't feel uh, comfortable with. And so that kind of begs the question of how can we make sure that our pharmacists are, are uh, adequately prepared um, to sort of do some of the SDOH screenings that they do. Um, and then general cultural competency and sensitivity is also um, one of the themes that was really important. Um, having really good uh, data-driven insights is also important. Um, that would, of course, depend on, I guess, the structure of, of each initiative's um, of each initiative's system, but that was also proven to be something that was vital to these programs that were successful. And Faria did a fantastic job sharing her data with us today. So um, thank you for that example, Faria. That was great to see that uh, live and in person, if you will, here. Um, so Faria, the next question we have is for you. Um, you mentioned uh, during the intervention that you described to us today about screening for food and nutrition security. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you screen? Did you have a validated tool you used? And if someone else is looking to screen for food and nutrition security, would you recommend that particular tool or what factors should they think about in picking a screening method? Yeah, I that is a great question. So we did use a validated tool to screen for food insecurity. We used the Hunger Vital Signs 2 questionnaire. And that was really important because the screenings happen during appointments with their providers. So obviously, we wanted to be really intentional on being able to integrate it into the workflow without asking too many questions or deviating from the appointment. So offering two questions, two really simple questions to be able to see if they are experiencing any food insecurity was really important for us. And so when they did meet those parameters, they were told about the program if they were interested in it. And and then when they would get enrolled, we would do more in-depth questionnaires to really see the level of food insecurity that they're experiencing. And then on top of that, we had a lot of questions that was informed by the community health worker. So questions that she normally uses to try to screen and see what those barriers are to be able to impact and give a really well-rounded care for patients. So once again, that community health worker really being such a valuable resource here. So thank you, Faria. Um, got another question for you. So um, you showed the logos of those partners that you worked with. So you had a really wide variety of partners that you worked with in your um, intervention here. So what advice do you have for others who are looking to establish partnerships? So this can be to address food security or really other social needs. Like what, what tips for success? What's the secret sauce? Anything you have to share related to partnerships? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously we're seeing the later end of those partnerships, but there is actually quite a bit of work that goes into developing those partnerships. So here at Checky, uh, we've been very intentional on creating those different partnerships for years and years. So with, it was with the food bank and some of the pharmacists from our team, they do work at IU and then um, with Nourish Rx as well. And so being able to bring all of those partners together in an intentional manner, we had put in the work to be able to do that instead of just, you know, coming to a new organization saying, hi, we're Checky, we want to be able to offer this, are you interested? So really working on networking and developing those relationships so that when we did want to have such a big project, everyone was on board and they knew that we had a lot of good rapport between each other and were able to offer it. Yeah, so having that rapport and just sounds like it takes time and effort for sure. But thank you for showing us what it can look like down the road uh, in a successful partnership. So thank you. Uh, Kara, question for you. You mentioned that the third edition of the SDOH guide is reorganized and we have the interventions group by setting. So can you tell us what prompted that reorganization and how you see that impacting the user's experience with using the guide? Yeah, absolutely. So um, kind of touching on something that I said earlier, when the readers looked at the guide in the second edition, their, um, the feedback that we got was that it was hard to try to find an initiative that um, sort of showed some sort of reproducibility um, depending on each setting. So we thought that organizing each initiative depending on practice setting would allow readers to find an initiative that they might be able to replicate um, in their own communities or within their own programs. Um, and 
I, I think that it would also give the readers a little bit more confidence um, because it is obviously difficult trying to trying to tackle a lot of SDOH barriers, whether you're a new program um, or, or this is a continuing initiative. So I think that being able to see another um, organization do something, I think that shows that it's feasible. Um, I think a lot of the initiatives have lessons learned that can kind of help readers figure out how to troubleshoot before they even encounter any problems. So I definitely think that this reorganization is going to be really useful for people that are actually looking for innovative ideas that are feasible for their practice setting. And, and, and member feedback was so crucial with that. Um, if you guys provided feedback, we really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, but incorporating their feedback, I feel like was was just the number one driver in that, but it, it was also things that, that we saw um, as well. So speaking of feedback, Kyra, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, this year's edition also allows readers to provide us feedback directly from the guide. So you can click within the guide and it will um, give you some prompts and questions. Uh, really short, but again, valuable feedback that we can use to develop resources in the future. So we'll, we'll keep that feedback theme going here. <laughs> Um, all right, Faria, another question for you. Um, so Checky has also done work to improve cardiovascular care and medication access. So Kyra showed a screenshot of our summary of that work towards the beginning of the webinar today. So can you tell us a little bit about how you performed SDOH related screenings in that work, how pharmacists were potentially involved and just any high level takeaways that you'd like to share from that work as well? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously as pharmacists, we love talking about medications and being able to access them. So we have our checky team pharmacists in a number of different community sites. So we are not only at clinics, but we're also at food banks. So for the cardiovascular interventions, we actually got a grant where we got support for a pharmacist to be able to provide cardiovascular screenings and blood pressure management through a collaborative practice agreement actually at a food bank. And this is kind of that flipped model that I was talking about. Instead of expecting patients to come to healthcare, we're bringing the healthcare to patients somewhere where they feel comfortable. Uh, and what we found from this is we're having great outcomes because not only is the pharmacist seeing the patient, but her appointments are also with a community health worker which has been incredible. So obviously they're doing the SDOH screenings during that appointment. And then the, the CHW is able to really impact those in the appointment. So what you have is that model that we keep talking about. You have clinical care on this side tied hand in hand to SDOH because we're learning now more than ever in order to have good outcomes, you have to be able to address those SDOH. Moving more on to the medication access side, something that we did find is even in pharmacy curriculum and through other different healthcare professions, we found that a lot of people feel like they did not get enough training to be able to navigate any problems with patients affording medications. And so we started brainstorming what is some kind of method that we can develop so we can impact this properly. And so we realized that there are a plethora of different siloed resources that can impact the cost of medications, but it can be a little bit overwhelming, especially if you're not a pharmacist, to be able to understand which resource you should use when. And so we actually developed an algorithm that's really easy to follow and actually focuses on individualized patient characteristics. So you start out, you have the type of insurance that they have, how to understand what those different insurances are. And then it goes in a stepwise approach according, according to if they have government insurance or they have private insurance on the different resources you can check and how those tie together to be able to provide that for patients. And so we have not only started incorporating this into the pharmacy curriculum, but we are also have figured out a few different healthcare systems where we're actually training healthcare professionals on how to use it. So a, a very wide variety of different occupations. And what we're seeing is, is that this is truly making an impact and this is things that people wish they had more of. So we're happy to be able to provide that. And we're still getting data on to see if the algorithm is easy to follow, if there's any tweaks that need to be made. But so far from the results that we're seeing, we're seeing that it has been extremely helpful for people to use. 
Wonderful. That sounds fantastic. And if uh, webinar attendees, if those in our audience would like to learn more about that work, uh, please check out the SDOH guide. At the bottom of our description are links to resources so you'd be able to read more about what Faria and her team are doing there, as well as with their uh, food and nutrition security work. So um, that is all the Q&A that we have for today. So I wanted to thank both Faria and Kyra once again for speaking today. Uh, we appreciate all the insights that you shared with our audience. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and with that, we are going to close out here with a few announcements so you know what's coming up here at PQA. And I am dropping several links in chat right now. So if you would like to take a look at those as we talk about each of these things, um, these will all go together. First, we want to invite you to please join us for our PQA annual meeting. Our 2024 PQA annual meeting will be uh, from May 14th through 16th in Baltimore, Maryland. The meeting is going to feature a variety of networking opportunities. We continually hear how valuable those are to our attendees. So those will be back once again. And we also will be hosting over 50 speakers who will share insights on a variety of topics. Those include things like value-based care, Medicare Quality Programs, the Inflation Reduction Act, Medication Therapy manage Management, and much more. You can register using the link in chat. So the first link that I just posted now will take you to the registration page. And we also invite you to increase your involvement in the meeting by volunteering for opportunities. And those include things like being a poster judge, uh, offering your insights to those who are attending the meeting for the first time. So being a experience sharer, if you will, during our first timer session. We also have an opportunity for attendees to mentor students and then also to serve as education session moderators. You can nominate yourself for those opportunities using the links in chat and please do uh, consider su submitting that self-nomination. And then finally, we will see you next month for a Quality Essentials webinar. It will feature a presentation on the next phase to advance quality measurement of oral anti-cancer medication use. The webinar is going to be on April the 11th. That is a Thursday as well from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. The registration link is the last one that I just dropped in chat. So if you would like to attend while you're thinking about it, uh, go ahead and register. And we do hope you to see you for that webinar next month. And then thank you to all of you for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of your day.